And welcome to High School Physics Explained, and today I would like to discuss the concepts of validity, reliability, and accuracy in experimental situations, or often known as first-hand investigations. But before we discuss those three terms, I want to quickly review what a first-hand investigation is. In essence, a first-hand investigation is simply an experiment or an investigation that you will carry out. You're collecting data from experiments. Just as a caveat, in science, designing experiments where you collect data from changing a single variable is often referred to as fair testing. Scientific inquiries can also include pattern seeking and exploring classifying things and making things and investigating models. And so this is just one aspect of scientific inquiry, but that's what I want to particularly focus on. In order to demonstrate our understanding of the terms validity, reliability, and accuracy, I'm going to refer regularly to an experiment, which is often referred to the pendulum experiment to determine the acceleration due to gravity. And the period in this case of our pendulum is equal to two pi multiplied by the square root of L over G. And so the period, which is the time for one complete cycle, is connected to the constant of two pi, the length of our string here in terms of the pendulum, and the acceleration due to gravity. Therefore, you can design an experiment that allows you to determine the acceleration due to gravity by varying the length and determining the period. So let's start with validity. And firstly, a valid experiment is simply what we would refer to as a fair test. And that is if the method is valid, if it investigates what you think it will investigate. In other words, you design an experiment that tests a hypothesis and you collect good data. Going back to our pendulum, what we need to ensure is that the experiment tests what we want to test. So let's say, here is my experiment with my pendulum, and I do this on the International Space Station. This experiment is designed to work out the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth. So if I do this experiment in the International Space Station, which is in orbit around the Earth, I don't get a value for G. If I were to start the pendulum, it would not go in a circle. So the idea of doing it in the space station is not valid because it will not test what I'm looking for. Secondly, if it incorporates suitable equipment. If I wanted to measure the period of this, and I simply start to say 1001, 1002, and 1003, and so forth, clearly that is not a good method to use to measure the time. So I might use a stopwatch to measure the time it swings back and forth, maybe a photo gate, so that as the pendulum bob moves through a beam of light, it starts and stops, let's say, a precise timer. And so that may be more appropriate method. Certainly, both the stopwatch and my photo gates are far better than me just counting 1001, 1002, and so forth to determine the period. Thirdly, something is valid if the variables are controlled. What does that mean? Well, if I'm changing one variable in order to determine the other variable, in other words, I'm changing the independent variable to therefore see the effect on the dependent variable, I need to ensure that any other variables are a constant because they cannot be changing the results. Now, in the case of my pendulum, if I increase the length, in other words, if I increase the independent variable, I therefore alter the period of the pendulum. But this formula here is only true for small angles. So let's say an angle less than five degrees. If I increase my initial deflection, let's say to 23 degrees or thereabouts, then this formula no longer applies because this formula is only accurate for small angles. There are other factors at play. Large angles will alter this particular formula. Now, I'm not going to go into the details mathematically why that is the case, but needless to say, if I try to do this experiment in such a way that I increase the angle every time I do the experiment, I'm including another variable which affects the final result. In other words, not all my variables are controlled. Finally, the experiment is valid if I use the appropriate measuring procedures. What do I mean by that? 
So let's say I have here my pendulum, and the length, of course, is determined, in this case, from the fulcrum to the object down here. But let's say I replace the mass with a bar that looks like this, and I decide to measure the length of the bar as in the terms of L. That's actually inappropriate because the fact now I have an object that has mass distributed evenly from the fulcrum right to the end rather than at the end. And so the appropriate measuring for L is not the length of the object, but the length to the center of mass. If I wanted to measure the length in this case, I need to measure it from the center of mass. So that is from this level to this level, and L would be that value that I have here. But if I use this object over here, I can't use the same length here. The appropriate thing is to measure from its center of mass. And assuming, and notice here, there is a lot of assumptions you have to make that this object is consistent in the distribution of mass, then the center of mass is here. And so the length that I use is that length there in determining the effect of the length on the period. Now let's now discuss reliability. And generally speaking, reliability means that you're getting multiple results that are consistently similar. That re requires repetition. You need to repeat them. That of course means that you do multiple repetitions of measurements in the experiment, or it could mean that the experiment itself is repeated multiple times. So here is our pendulum, and it is swinging multiple times. How do I ensure reliability? I could measure the time for one swing. Now let's say I'm using a stopwatch and I stop the start and stop the stopwatch when it reaches, let's say, a single point that I determine where it stops and starts. And I do it once. Now that, of course, is not very reliable because I've only done it once. And let's say I do it multiple times and I get various values of, let's say, 1.1, 1.3, 1.4, 1.2, 1.5, 1.6, 1.3, and so forth, I'm getting now numerous results that are relatively similar. So by the fact that I have done this multiple times and the values are relatively similar, we could say I've increased the reliability. However, I might decide that I, instead of measuring the time for one cycle, I might do this experiment and measure the time for, let's say, 10 cycles. I might get 11.2, 10.9, 11.3, 10.2, and so forth. Let's say these are my values. And then I work out the average of this value and then divide by 10. My likelihood is that the final result is much more reduced in random errors. And it is more reliable because there is a lot smaller margin of error between, let's say, the uh, values that I, uh, the average I get to the actual true period of this situation. Remember, in all of these cases, that we are trying to determine the true period, but our measuring technique automatically means that we will probably not get that exact value, and we want to make sure that our value that we use is as close to the true value. And so by repeating the experiment and improving our technique, we are therefore ensuring that our final result is as close as possible to the true value. Finally, let's talk about accuracy. Now, accuracy in an first investigation is simply that we get a result that is close to the true value of the quantity measured. This has to be substantiated also with secondary sources, but in our case, with our pendulum. So here's our pendulum and I graph my, my periods and my length and I get a result that looks something like this. And from the slope here, I'm able to determine the value for G and I end up getting, let's say, a value of 9.79 meters per second squared. Now this is very close to the accepted value of the acceleration due to gravity, which we know to be 9.81 meters per second squared. There is a very small percentage error between these two values. So we say well, that this is a reasonably accurate experiment. We're getting close to the accepted value. Now, if I am ensuring that my experiment is valid and I am ensuring reliability 
it is hoped that that would lead to a greater accuracy. But that isn't always the case. Sometimes you can be very reliable and very valid, but end up getting a value that is different. And that may be a case where you have a factor that is an unknown factor at play contributing to your experiment. Unlikely to be in this simple situation, but it happens in science all the time where experiments are valid and reliable, but they don't give you the result you would expect. And that often warrants further investigation. So to, in summary, let's use a dartboard to give us an understanding of validity and reliability and accuracy. And I'm going to show you a series of diagrams of dartboards with spots that represent a person firing darts at that board. And I want you, here are a number of samples, to discuss the validity and reliability and accuracy in each of these cases. It's worthwhile pausing the video and think through the, the concepts and then I'll go through each one of them. So let's look at this one. Here we have multiple results, but you can see that the results are all over the place. So although there was lots of repetition here, the fact is, is that there isn't a close pattern here of aiming towards the center. So we could argue that our technique here is not reliable even though we have multiple results. The fact is that, that they are totally spread out. Is it valid? Could be valid in the terms of the fact that there, if you average it out, it's twirled towards the center, but it's arguable. And very few have hit the center, so uh, it would be a very questionable validity. Let's have a look at this one here. Here we've got close results and multiple results. So it definitely is reliable because we have multiple results that are grouped close together. However, it's definitely not valid. And the reason why it is not valid is because the results are definitely skewed away from where we're wanting to fire the shot. Now, that means maybe not an appropriate use of measuring equipment. So for example, your measuring device needs to be calibrated. There is an error automatically to put in. We have this deviation from the expected results. And that can only be determined by looking at maybe your accuracy, your final results. So you repeated the experiment multiple times, but the final results still skewed. So there's a question of validity here. Is there an unknown variable at play? Did you not use your measuring equipment correctly? Do they need to be calibrated and so forth? In this case, we have reliability. Why? Because we have multiple results and they're all consistent relative to each other. We also here have validity as well. And that's because they are grouped together to where we want to hit the target. And so we would argue that this is both reliable and valid and that has led to accuracy as a result. Now let's have a look at the bottom two. They're a little bit different. You can see we have hit the target first go and clearly it's not reliable. Why? Because there's absolutely no repetition. Now, sure, we got in the center and sure, we could argue that that is because we're good at throwing darts, but it is just as likely that your experiment, if you continue the experiment along, you might get shots that are over here afterwards. So you cannot judge by a single data point that it is valid because it could be a grouping of results where this is the extreme of one of those results. So it's not reliable and it's not necessarily valid at all and repetition would be required to confirm the validity. Of course, here's the same story. This is quite far off. Is it valid? Possibly. Is it because it could be a spurious result? But it, Again, it's certainly not reliable because we only have one result. Now, if this was one spurious result and all your subsequent darts were in like so, you can say, look, I have a valid experiment. I have a reliable experiment. This is a spurious result. I'm going to ignore it because it's clearly an outlier. But if I were to have significant results in between like so, one would question straight away as you increase the repetition that you can see that we are sort of screwed to one side so the validity is down. 
Finally, one example of a experiment that garnered a bit of world attention. There was an experiment at CERN that was called the Opera Experiment, where they were looking at creating various types of neutrinos. And the neutrinos were allowed to pass from CERN to a sensor in Italy. And when they initially did the experiment, they discovered that it traveled in 2.4 milliseconds. But that meant that the neutrinos, which everyone expected was traveling at the speed of light, was actually traveling faster than the speed of light. It was subsequently discovered that there was a loose optic cable. Nonetheless, the experiment was repeated and as a result of the repetition, they actually got values for the speed of the neutrinos at the speed of light. The experiment was again repeated independently at a number of other experiments. And again, because of the repetition, they discovered that the value was still traveling at the speed of light. In other words, the initial experiment had an outlier, it had a validity issue, and subsequent experiments, repetition, confirm that. I hope that has helped you understand reliability, validity and accuracy in first-hand investigations. My next video will discuss those terms, validity, reliability and accuracy, as they apply to looking at secondary sources. Thanks for watching. Please remember, like, share and subscribe. And by the way, drop a comment down below if the video particularly has been useful. And finally, consider supporting me via Patreon. The idea is to develop resources and equipment to continue to teach physics at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.